Welcome back to Bowman's Woods. This has been a long time coming, this episode, because I've been so busy clearing land and getting this homestead done. So this episode is going to be kind of a flashback as to all the things we've done so far, because it has been a long time since I've done an episode. I'm going to call this episode the intro to the ICF off-grid homestead. It's a mouthful, but what it means is we're building a house that's completely off-grid, not connected to any city power at all, no water, no sewer, nothing. Of course, like most rural properties, my water is going to come from a well, my sewer is going to be a septic system. That's pretty commonplace. But the unique thing of this off-grid homestead is it's going to be completely powered by solar panels. It's going to have 28 500 watt bifacial solar panels. So that's about 14,400 watts of solar panels. Hopefully that's enough. I did build in the opportunity to expand on that. I'm going to have over 20,000 kilowatts of lithium battery banks. And then I'm going to have a propane power generator for backup. And I don't see any way that that's going to be needed in the summertime when there's plenty of sun. But in the winter, when it's dark and gloomy and there's not that many hours of sunlight, a propane or some sort of diesel backup generator is kind of a must because otherwise you may find that you are reading by candlelight because there's just not enough solar to keep the batteries charged. And you may have noticed from the title, I haven't mentioned anything about the ICF yet. So ICF just means this is not going to be a stick frame build. This is going to be an ICF build, which stands for uh, integrated cement foam or something. So the foam is the outside layer and then you pour the cement into it. That's how you make your walls. I'll show you all that in, in a second, but that gives you extra soundproofing, extra R value. It's just a primo way to make a pretty much bulletproof bomb shelter type of house. So we're going to be really excited to get that done. It's something we've never seen before. I've never had an ICF house built before. So we're learning a lot there as well. And the other unique thing about this homestead is it's going to be heated by an outdoor wood boiler with in-floor radiant PEX tubing under the cement floor for heating the main floor. And then for the second floor, we will have a propane powered uh, forced air furnace. If we find the second floor is a little cool, we can throw that on. But then again, that's not running off solar panels. That's running off propane. So I hope to avoid that. I'm hoping that the heat from the main floor rises to the second floor of the house. We'll see. And if you're going to heat your whole house and my water heater as well for dishes and showers is going to be heated by the wood boiler as well. So you're going to need a lot of firewood. And as you fly over, you can see there are some dead ash trees in there. Anything you see that looks standing dead, those are most likely ash trees. They were killed by the ash beetle. But the rest of this forest, when I walk through it, looks to be about 85% maple, some oak, of course some ash, and some other stuff mixed in there. But it is mostly a maple forest with just a few patches of evergreens mixed in there, some, some pines and whatnot. So there is plenty of wood. So let me just throw a quick clip here. I have to get ready for this coming winter by uh, cutting down some of these dead trees. I was never a lumberjack prior to this. Anybody who knows the channel knows I was a police officer for 30 years. Never cut a tree down in my life until I owned this property. So, <laughs> so far I haven't la lost any fingers, toes, or other uh, appendages. So I'm doing okay. And cutting the tree down is just step one. After that, you got to cut it into rounds and then split it into firewood. Now you could split it the old fashioned way with an ax and a maul or whatever. No, thank you. I'm way too old for that. So we went to Easton Maid in Perth and bought ourselves a splitter and a conveyor to uh, throw all that freshly split wood into what I call a wood corral where I made a floor of pallets and then the conveyor just drops the wood onto a pile where it can then dry or as they call it season and if we can get the uh, moisture down below 20 percent then that is perfect season wood to put in that gasification wood boiler so yeah as much as you say the heat is free you're not really free when you count buying the land and buying the chainsaws and buying the splitters and buying the... You know what I mean? You get my point. But once you get all set up, then your heat is free. So that's our wood splitting process. And as you can see with this machine, you can split wood really, really fast. I mean, one person can run it by themselves, but if you have two people, you got somebody bringing on new logs while somebody's pulling the levers to move the hydraulic press. And this is just showing the wood corral, showing a bit of the slash. So there's a blade at the top where the logs are supposed to go in one side in the middle of the pile and the slash or the, the little scraps are supposed to go to the front. But unfortunately, the uh, slash slider, if you want to call it, is not long enough. So it needs to be extended so that the slash ends up outside your wood pile. But I've already done a bunch more splitting since then. So this pile is way back at the beginning when it was pretty measly. I think this might have been our first day really splitting. But uh, yeah, it won't take long to fill this entire corral. In fact, we've already put 
pallet walls around it to uh, stop any of the wood from rolling out onto the grass. Again, this episode's just the intro. It's just giving you a taste of what we've been up to. There's going to be episodes of the future where we go back and we go into more detail in some of these areas, how we made the trails, how we made the uh, wood corral, or why we made the wood corral for drawing purposes. That's, a, that's an important thing to learn. You don't need to stack your wood. You can pile it in a corral as long as you keep it off the ground, doesn't get moisture. And then I've bought since then, this ATV has an ATV trailer now where I can go into the forest and cut up browns, throw them in the trailer, and bring them back here. Before, I, when I just had the ATV, it would take multiple trips to bring an entire trees worth of rounds out to the splitter so there's a lot to learn and all of these things can get in more detail in the future and future episodes so just put in the comments areas that you're interested in now if i'm going to give you some kind of chronological format of how you get this woodland to be sort of a buildable area the most important thing is you're going to have to clear some land now with my tractor i had a flail mower which was only designed to make trails through the light scrubby brush no trees no nothing i gotta say though i don't know if i even want to waste an episode on this the brand i got adele marino has broken numerous times and it's been very expensive and now i'm almost ready to throw the thing in the garbage but when it was working it was great for making trails and i'll show you a little bit of a hyperlapse now of the trails that were created now, in the front of the property, it was just using the flail mower to create trails through the light, you know, the light brush and grass. Um, when I got further in, though, I needed to actually take out trees. And you, yes, you can cut them down with a chainsaw, but you're going to eventually need to pull the roots out. Otherwise, you're going to have stumps everywhere. So I splurged and bought myself an excavator, a Kubota KX040. And I got to say, I love this excavator. And with that, I was able to not only cut the trees down, to get through some denser areas where I just couldn't get through, obviously, with just a flail mower, um, and cut the tree down with a chainsaw, then dig the stumps up with the uh, excavator, and then with the excavator bulldozer blade on the front, kind of smooth out the dirt, fill in some dirt, some holes where the roots used to be, and make trails. So, yeah, you can see how with this hyperlapse of the trails, you know, I've now opened up this 155 acres to be something that's really enjoyable to ride around on the ATV. When people come to visit, it's almost like an amusement park ride now. Come to Craig's property because he'll take you on some ATV rides through the trails. And uh, my uh, older relatives say it's like going to a carnival ride. You know, it's just fun for the whole family. So that's been kind of fun. But to clear the wide open spaces that you're going to need to build a house, you need to take out everything in an area. Like we're talking trees, shrubs, everything. Way more than my flail mower can handle, especially since my flail mower breaks constantly and uh, I can't do more than just mow grass with it at this point. So yeah, I brought in the big guns. I paid a guy who had a massive skid steer and a massive mulcher on the front to come and just grind everything down in the area that I was gonna build. And I'm telling you, this beast was impressive. It could take down anything, including trees. I was super impressed, especially since I'm coming from a flail mower that can barely cut anything more than grass without breaking. This guy's literally running over small trees. In fact, he can run over just about any tree. There was some dead ash in the front of the property. And he said to me, so you want me to just keep the trees that look like they're alive? And I said, yeah, anything that's a shrubbery or, or a dead tree, you can take it down. And he would literally just mulch into even a full size tree maybe two feet off the ground, grind it till it falls over, and then run over it till it's just wood chips. It was incredibly powerful. So this is pretty much what the end result looked like for the area that we cleared to build the house. As you can see, there's still some trees, uh, trees that were kind of healthy and vibrant. He kept them. And then anything that was, you know, either scrub brush, which there was a lot of scrub brush around this area, or dying dead trees, he took them down. So yeah, well worth doing. If you've got a bunch of area you need to clear, get one of these guys they've got the equipment it takes them no time at all he did all this in one day so yeah it well worth it in my opinion and here's kind of a drone shot of that scrub brush you can see the trailer so for reference where that is and it's the wood splitter off on the left there so most of this was like you can see just scrubby grassy brushy a lot of prickly ash which i hate because you get anywhere near it it scratches the crap out of you so i was glad to see that stuff gone and the stuff right up near the road we kept just for privacy so when we're back there and people are driving by they can't really see us which is nice giving you a little bit of a sneak peek of what future episodes will be about we're going to go through the whole build process in more detail this is just a drone shot of the footings being poured the very very first stage so we're scraped right down to bedrock and then those wooden boards are the footings and uh, now you can see the i call it the cement tube truck 
So that's the truck that pours the cement out. And then as they zoom out here, you're gonna notice actual cement trucks back up to it and pour the cement in. And then this monster arm can reach all the way around the property and pour cement wherever you need it. Once the footings are dry, they obviously take away all the wood boards and then they start clicking in these ICF foam blocks. What they do is they snap together and then they put a rebar in the middle. And once that's done, they pour the cement into the wall. They don't make it too tall at first because they still have to pour the floors for the garage and the main house. And the cement guys say they don't want a lot of shadows and shade on the cement so that it all dries evenly. And once you have the low cement walls done, it's time to do the stone slinging. This is an interesting little conveyor belt that fires stones wherever that operator wants it to go. This is in the garage and we also do the same thing in the main floor of the house. And then after that, they put specialized foam down that's got little ridges so they can put the PEX tubing for the radiant floor heating. The one in the garage is done already and there's an HVAC designer that designs the uh, layout of those tubes and now they're just starting to work on the main floor of the house. This drone shot shows the foam a little bit better. You can see there's little ridges built into it so when you lay the PEX pipe like Ryland's doing here, it'll stay in place at least until you get time to come back with a little tool they have that clamps it down onto the foam so that it doesn't pop out. That way they can follow the uh, exact location that the plan has set out for the pipes to make sure that we have equal floor heating. Once the PEX tube is fully installed, they put it under air pressure to make sure there aren't any leaks. And once we're 100% sure, no leaks in the line, it's time to pour the actual floor. This is the floor for the garage, and they'll do the exact same process for the floor of the main house. This is the time they add cement, and you gotta make sure it's level. So even though they're smoothing it out, there's a guy every once in a while with a laser level that puts it on top of the fresh cement just to make sure that it's still completely level. And if there isn't, they add a little bit more. And if there's too much, a guy with a rake will pull it a little bit away. And then after that, they bring out these things called power trowels, I think is what they were calling them. I call them buffers. They just look like big floor buffers. And it kind of, one guy goes along and kind of roughs up the surface and the other guy has one that smooths out the surface. It just makes sure that there's no humps or lumps or high points on the cement and it also smooths it out when they're done with that. And the last thing they do is they cut these little uh, seams in the cement. I guess they're pressure relief points so that if the house ever heaved or sunk or whatever, it would crack along that line and not across the uh, big square piece. I don't think that's gonna happen with this house because we've built this house directly on bedrock. So I don't think there's gonna be any movement or heaving, but this is just the way it is. You can see if you kind of look at it from a certain angle, there's little cut marks in the cement for, I guess, like I call them pressure relief crack areas. But uh, yeah, that's the end of the floor. So now that they've gotten rid of that, you can see the gray of the garage floor that was poured two days earlier and the darker kind of dark, dark gray on the main floor that hasn't quite perfectly cured yet. But now that that's done, the guys can go ahead and put up the ICF walls like they wanted to do much quicker to get going on the next pour. And this time they're gonna be pouring the whole wall about 15 feet up all the way around. So you can see that there's massive braces to support the ICF blocks so that as they're pouring in, and they will use vibrators to make sure all the cement goes down there aren't any voids. But as that massive amount of cement is poured down those walls, those the braces will be there to support the wall. Now that's where we are up to today. I haven't seen the wall being poured yet. That's the next stage, so I will definitely film that. If this is something you're interested in, if you've ever wanted to live in an off-grid house, solar powered, heated with wood, or any of that interests you, definitely subscribe to the channel, hit that bell notification to let you know when the next episode is gonna be in. This was a broad overview of everything that's happened so far. In the next episodes, I'll go back into a little bit more detail on why we did certain things and some of the steps that I've kind of glossed over very quickly will be maybe a longer form in, an, in a future episode. So hopefully you're looking forward to that. If you found this entertaining or informative, show the channel some love by giving it a thumbs up. Again, subscribe if you haven't already and I'll catch you on the next one. Ciao for now.